as well. Let us uh, begin this morning with our call to worship. Our call to worship is uh, another episode of our long-running series, We Are the Church. And today's We Are the Church uh, feature is uh, Charlie Tilt, and Ch Charlie's here today. And so let us um, prepare our hearts for worship as we hear uh, stories from Charlie's faith journey. My name is Charlie, and alias Chicken Charlie, as I'm known in the community. Well, I can't answer that question. However, if you get a hold of uh, one of our dear members, uh, Claudette Crowder, I think she'll be able to tell you. I do know I was here when we became a two-point charge. So I don't know how long ago that was. Well, we tried a number, Nancy and I tried a number of churches in the neighborhood and nothing sort of fit in to what we had, what we wanted. So we ended up at Nascawea here with Claudette asking us, and we met a nice group of individuals who I was a little younger than they were, so they were sort of my mentors. How's that? There were two of them, and it goes back to Mona Story. And when the church here was deciding to become a two-point charge, there were a lot of discussions. I hadn't been here very long, but I dealt a lot with groups. And she made the comment that if it doesn't work out, we'll continue on the way we are. And I got up and said, Mona, if we become a two-point charge, this church is going to totally change in the way its thinking is and she kind of looked at me, and it has, it big time. We've got a lot of individuals who have stepped up to the plate. We've had two good ministers. And once we had decided that, Mona got up in the middle of the service one day and corrected Sean's grammar in the middle of his sermon. And I thought, isn't that interesting? We've now got a congregation helping get through life and they're thinking on the same, same way that the minister is. And I thought, that's a good start. So those two moments really stood out. Mona is no longer with us, but I often think back and I look at the congregation and guess what, it's dynamic. Yes, I think the day you became the minister, because I did see you, was it at Convocation in Waterloo? And I thought at that time, whoever does a selection, if you don't select them, you're missing out. Welcoming, full of energy, ready to pick up the ball and throw it to home plate, willing to do anything they're asked to do. And that's hard. I do like the parable of the tares because when you're working with ground and working with nature, you have to nurture it. So that stands out for me, that uh, parable. The camaraderie. The camaraderie is, you know, 
Zoom doesn't do it for me. Sorry, it just doesn't. So that's when I had the chance to come back. I was here. One of the reasons that really makes me want to come is the music that's played. And Jennifer just warms my heart with her singing. Uh, I really like her solos and your accompaniment and singing goes right along with it. So that's likely the big moment every Sunday morning. My favorite hymn, there's a little story to it. In my mother's Bible, she had a Bible and it was full of all sorts of things. But the one hymn that stung out, stood out was in the garden. And I'm not sure whether we played it at her funeral or not, but uh, I was sitting in a restaurant in Elmira, I think it was two years later, having breakfast and at eight o'clock in the morning, they played her favorite hymn. And I actually stood up. And a lot of the people in the uh, restaurant did wanting to know why. So I told them. So her favorite hymn was In the Garden. We are the church, and let's keep it that way. We are the church, the body of our Lord. We are all God's children. We have been restored. We have been restored. We have been restored. Come to God in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, today we are in awe 
of your mercy, in awe of your love, and your compassion for your creation. What amazing love that you would bring into existence a world, people, a universe. And yet, you would still enter into that universe in Jesus Christ to be with us. What great love, what amazing grace that you would teach us your ways, that you would forgive us, that you would send your very Son to die for our sins. God, we are in awe this morning. And we reflect on this week and the way we have lived day to day. And we know that we are not worthy of such love and such grace. We are not worthy of your mercy and your forgiveness. And yet still, it is there for us. And that is why we can come to you and confess our sin, confess the wrongs that we have done, not because of anything we have done, but because you have loved us first. And so we, we lay that all down this morning and ask for that grace once again in our lives that we might be um, made perfect in Christ Jesus and that we might be an instrument of worship this morning worthy to praise you. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I'm now going to invite uh, Claudette to lead us in our scripture reading this morning. The reading this morning is from Ephesians 2, verses 4 to 22. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ. Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, not the result of work, so that no one may boast. For we are what He has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. So then, remember, that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who call, were called the circumcision, a physical circumcision that made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you are, were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself 
one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace. And might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access to one spirit, to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are built together spiritually in the dwelling place for God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, before we get to the sermon, this week I wanted to uh, share a video. Now it's a little longer video. It will be most of the sermon itself. Um, we're wrapping up our sermon series on legacy by looking at the legacy of grace. And I, so I wanted to begin by watching this video from the Presbyterian Church in Canada, which was produced as part of the final report of the Rainbow Communion, which was a special committee set up by the General Assembly, to listen to the stories of hurt and harm done by the church's homophobia, transphobia, heterosexism, and hypocrisy. The video is entitled, Not All Are Welcome. And so I wanted to share this video, um, not only as a precursor to the conversations that we will have through the body, mind, and soul study. But I think if we're going to seek to live into the legacy of grace that has been passed on to us, that we do have to confront a different legacy in the church. And today I'm going to call it the legacy of disgrace. And that's a long legacy. It's a legacy of the ways that the church has lacked grace. And so I want you to think about grace as we watch together and listen to these stories. And as I emailed earlier this week that some of the stories may be um, a little triggering for some. And so just a, a caution about that. And of course, if you'd like to talk to me um, after um, the service or um, later this week about it, uh, you're more than welcome to email or give me a call. So let us uh, watch this video together. Not all are welcome. There are people who grew up in the church that were told that they don't deserve God's love and that they are going to hell. When he came out to his grandfather, the patriarch of the family, a Bible was thrown at his head. He was told he wasn't welcome in their family. He was a kid, out of home, became addicted to substances and exploited in the sex trade. He experienced a fatal overdose. The church did harm to me as an LGBT person. It is devastating to me that I will never get back the years of my life that I have lost to self-hatred. I can't imagine that I will get enough counseling to keep me from feeling that deep sense of wrongness, that lack of worthiness. I began to realize that I was gay, and at the time, I believed it was wrong. You know, as many Christians go through, 
and I went through the whole pray away the gay stage for years. Every night from the age of 16 until I was 19. Just really begging to God, turn me straight. Attempts at conversion therapy was just a fruitless endeavor that simply increased my despair. As a closeted gay Christian who feared eternal damnation, I was desperate to do something. The exclusionary practices of homophobia, hypocrisy, and heterosexism meant that my child eventually succumbed to, to crippling, invisible depression. So it was on a long, long journey of practically smelling death in our house every day, and we did not talk to anybody at the church about it. I was relationally isolated. I, I was so afraid of being found out that I closed myself off to everyone. No friendships with men or women. So I just totally shut myself down. And eventually I, I found myself to be sort of a dead person emotionally. I, I was not a nice person. Well, that way, no one would want to be close to me. To be anything other than straight in the church is to be constantly engaged in a battle to put away false guilt and shame. It is to feel less than whole, just to hear the subtle and covert messages of hatred and rejection all the time. It's to live a nightmare each and every day, and it never ends. It's to live in constant fear and vigilance with stress and trauma being the norm. I feel as though I abandon my God if I leave, but if I stay, I feel as if I abandon myself. I lived with constant tension for most of my life. I was a closeted gay minister, married, a parent, underwent so-called conversion therapy, depression and contemplated suicide. I saw that my only two options were to kill myself or run away. There are kids who have killed themselves and they are part of the PCC and were gay. We are very sinful in that we are complicit in their deaths. It turned out that one of the members of the congregation who had mysteriously disappeared had committed suicide. He'd come out to his minister. His minister had told him that he was a severe sinner and that God would heal him and advised him to get married to a woman who had two children. So he married her. After he read the 1994 report, he wrote a note and he committed suicide. I've grown up in the Presbyterian Church. Sometimes I get the sense that when people discuss this issue, they think that gay people are outside the church and are criticizing the church. You know, I, I think it's important for people in our church to realize that there are gay people in the church who have grown up in the church. It's in my blood and my bones to be Presbyterian. My, my grandparents and my parents were elders in the church. My father was the clerk of session. My mother ran the WMS. So when people tell me, you know, just go and join the United Church, I say, no, that's not who I am. The Presbyterian Church has been my church, my community, where my family has been connected for all these years. I was given an equal and legitimate platform to share my story. My racially diverse congregation listened without judgment as I was transitioning from male to female. They continued to welcome and support me. There was curiosity and non-invasive questioning from the congregation, but I was never misgendered. I finally found an affirming church in the PCC after realizing my former church would not accept me. I cried in the park by myself. I realized how much I needed this space. I, I needed this so much. I 
just needed this part of my life to come back. It has suddenly occurred to me that queerness has shaped my ministry to, to be gentler, not judgmental. Being queer is a gift, a way to see the world. I've had some really great experiences ever since coming out in church spaces. It has given other people space. People crown me to ask, how's your partner? Or, you know, my sister's gay. <laughs> people keep asking questions. I'm thinking to myself, I, I know what's going on here. People are looking for that safe person to talk to and disclose their story. You know, it's, it's amazing how you become that safe person for others by living your life honestly. I'm living with fear because there's still that old, mostly homophobic thinking in church. You, you don't even know who you can tell. Uh, I don't want it to stop my dream of getting ordained and helping people and becoming a missionary. I have to live a double life and be careful. It was several decades ago that I made my decision to proceed towards the ministry of word and sacraments. If I'd have known then what I know now, I would have never have done it. I'd have looked for some other line of work uh, rather than live a life of forced celibacy. As an ordained person working in the church, I'm always feeling the pressure to stay silent about my kid who identifies as LGBTQI. I keep asking myself, how can I support my kid through university if I can't stay employed? I have to keep my mouth shut. I realized that I had been holding on to the stuff for so long and never got the opportunity to sit down and tell my story to the Presbyterian Church because they said, we don't want to hear it actually. That was for me the biggest sin done to me by the Presbyterian Church in Canada. I thought, boy, this just doesn't feel like church to me. You know, this feels like something else. I mean, really, just to say it really clearly, it felt like the General Assembly molested me on that day in the sanctuary in front of everyone. That's what it felt like. We were members of St. Columba by the Lake and Daryl McDonald was there and we got to know him and we heard him preach. And I thought, what's wrong with this system? This man is a superb preacher. Why don't they want him in the pulpit? I worried for my Korean parents. If it gets out that their child is gay, they would believe that they raised something shameful. That shame is intergenerational and not just born on the shoulders of the gay child. The Bible is full of one story after the other, oppression and oppression and oppression and oppressors. Then that opens the door to the oppression of the LGBTQI people and the oppression of people of color. We need to ask, who are bearing those wounds? And then, let's talk about those wounds. As a bisexual, the biggest issue I encounter is those who won't believe that I can be monogamous. Now that my physical transitioning is happening, I'm being told that being trans is a mental illness. People don't realize the mental anguish, harm, and pain I experienced prior to transitioning. I feel disempowered, shamed, and stifled by pervasive, subtle transphobia. I came to the point of potential suicide or to transition. I could not pretend I was cisgender any longer. My different development, as well as my general appearance, 
and the way I spoke and acted made me a target of some serious bullying. Over time, I learned to hide my secrets and try not to stand out. I tried to play the role of a typical young man, though I felt deep down that I wasn't. I learned not to look at that part of myself, to hate my chest and the other features known pretty well only to me of an intersex person. My sister's husband wouldn't let my gay brother into their house because they had boys. I said to them, he's gay. He's not a pedophile. I definitely think one of the things holding me back after I came out to myself was the long history of stigma around LGBTQ people working with children, especially gay people. It was definitely something that I never wanted to be associated with me, even though I knew it wasn't right. And it was homophobic to think that way. At one General Assembly, a listening table, some people became really hostile and manipulative. One explained to me that you won't be a PCC minister anymore and have no pension. And that was just because I expressed affirming views. Our daughter is so angry at the way the church has treated her LGBTQI sibling. She will not come back to the church. And she doesn't understand why we continue to attend If a church says it's affirming or welcoming without changes to the heteronormative language and culture, hymns, and imagery, it's just lip service and tokenism. I read the apology that came out a while ago. I appreciated that it was a step. It felt, to me, disingenuous when the church continues to harm people. I've never been betrayed by someone who I know that hates me. I've only been betrayed by the people who I thought loved me. There are examples where the church has been oppressive with respect to race and gender throughout history, but there are also examples where the church has repented for these actions. It is possible. For healing to truly happen, we must listen to the voices of LGBTQI people in the PCC and continue to create spaces where we can say, we want to hear your story and you are not going to be punished for it. In its repentance from homophobia, transphobia, heterosexism and hypocrisy, it is important for the church to name and to address the harm that's been done to people who identify as LGBTQI and others. It is important to mention LGBTQI people in public discourse and in prayers. Remove the fear of saying the actual words out loud. Lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, and intersex. I hope that one day congregations will have the knowledge and resources to adequately support people who are questioning their sexuality or gender. I was at my first Pride and I was standing there and I saw the Presbyterian Pride people walking by and I called out to my minister. She came over to the rails and gave me a hug. The biggest turning point in my entire life, I think, was that hug from my minister.
Thank you, everyone, for taking time to uh, watch that video together. I think it's very important that we uh, hear those stories, um, not just the, the leaders in the church, but the wider church. I imagine that some of that was a little hard to hear this morning. My hope, though, is that somewhere in those stories, and somewhere, hopefully, in my sermon, that you will also feel God's grace working in the midst of the harm that has been done. When we think of the legacy of grace in the church, it can be easy to forget that the church has a long history of not offering grace to others. Today, we've seen evidence of that in the stories of LGBTQI persons and their families. But there's many other stories that could be told. And today we find ourselves as individuals, as a community of faith, and as part of the, I'll call it the capital C Church, we find ourselves in need of that very grace and forgiveness that we have neglected to offer others. And so, as those in need of grace this morning, I thought that we might turn to Paul's letter to the Ephesians and hear what Paul has to say about the legacy of grace. Ephesians is a good letter for us to, to look at because Paul was writing to a church that was struggling with hypocrisy. They were struggling with prejudice. It was a church that was lacking grace for those who were different from them. In Paul's case, he is writing to a multicultural church made up of Jews and Gentiles, and both groups needed a refresher on grace. So Paul begins by telling the Ephesians of their need for grace. He writes that before grace, he says that they were dead through their sin, their trespasses. And he uses words like strangers and aliens to describe his readers. He wants them to remember what it was before grace before grace entered their lives. He wants them to remember when they were once far off, he says, and without God. He wants them to remember that once they had no hope, but now they do because of grace. And we, too, forget that we are continuously in need of God's grace, which, which is why it's so important when we forget that the church needs to listen to the voices of those we have sinned against, those we have had no grace for, not so that we might just wallow in our hopelessness, but so that we can be opened up again to that need for grace and recognize it and turn to God and be healed. We need those voices to lead us to repentance, back to a merciful God, and back to the legacy of grace. Because grace is good news, especially for a church that is living the legacy of disgrace. Listen to the good news according to Paul. He writes, But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive again together with Christ. For by grace you were saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is the gift 
of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. The good news is that despite our past, despite our legacy of disgrace, God, it says, who is rich in mercy, has given us grace, a gift we did not earn, a gift we do not deserve. But God continues to pour out that grace on us and draw us nearer and nearer to the heart of God, which is that grace. Yes, the church has sinned greatly. Yes, the church has caused much harm. But even when we seem like we are dead and irredeemable, God continues to give us new life through Christ. We can turn around. We can start walking in a new legacy, the legacy of grace. Only by the grace of God, we say thanks be to God. Now, that might seem like a great place to end. <laughs> Sin, and grace, confession, forgiveness, but, but Paul doesn't stop there in his letter. He, he, the legacy of grace is far grander for Paul, and he goes on to talk about the path with which grace leads us. And this is what he writes. For he is our peace, he's talking about Christ, in his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, Jew and Gentile, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the Christ, putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you're no longer strangers, Paul says, and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ as the cornerstone. In Christ, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. That was a lot, but in short, the church is the house that grace built. The grace God has given to the Gentile is the same grace that God has given to the Jew. It's the same grace that God has given me, and it's the same grace that God has given you. It's the same grace that God has given to the church and it's the same grace that God has given to those outside the church, those who are far off, in order that the walls that are between us might be broken down and peace and reconciliation would reign. You know, one of the things that we keep hearing in our uh, We Are the Church's videos, when it comes to that question, how would you describe Nasagawea? We always hear welcoming. Nasagawea is a welcoming congregation. And we are to some. Maybe we are even to many people, but we aren't always aware of the subtle ways that we exclude the unconscious ways that we judge, the micro ways that we lack grace. So that is, that is why I wanted us to watch this video, Not All Are Welcome Today. And that is why we're, we're having this uh, study through body, mind, and soul 
so that we can better understand each other and better understand our LGBTQI neighbor. Because if we want to be part of God's legacy of grace, we need to build a church where no one is a stranger. We need to build a church that grows together with others into that house that Paul is talking about, a house that is the dwelling place of God. The greatest gift that God gave us is grace through Jesus Christ. The greatest gift that we can give another human being is the same gift of grace. It truly is the gift of life. It makes those who are dead alive again. So today, may God be gracious to us and may that grace shine through us to the many generations that will come after us so that they might know, like we know, the legacy of grace. Amen. Caroline Patterson to lead us in the prayers of the people. Enduring God, on this Legacy Sunday, we thank you today for your faithfulness to us and to the tradition that has shaped us as disciples of Jesus. Thank you for your living word, which continues to reveal him, and for the gift of your spirit to help us interpret your wisdom in the midst of challenging times. God of guidance, speak into our lives today. Eternal God, on this Sunday, marking the faithfulness of all your saints, we give you thanks for people in our lives and across the ages who have shown us your loving kindness through their witness to Christ in so many different situations. We think of Betty in Peru and her sister Marjorie in Ecuador, 
and my cousin Maisie in the Congo. Inspire us by their examples and show us how we too can live out our faith in the midst of challenging times. God of guidance, speak into our lives today. Loving God, you keep calling us to care for those in need and show hospitality to strangers in our midst. Thank you for your persistent love, which continues to comfort and challenge us all. Open our hearts and eyes so that we can see how to offer that love to others in the midst of challenging times. God of guidance, speak into our lives today. Living God, you bring new life to the discouraged and those facing danger and death. Thank you for signs of hope which break into pressures of the pandemic and its consequences for so many in the midst of challenging times. God of guidance, speak into our lives today. Creating God, we praise you for the beauty of this world and the rhythms of nature which sustain us. Give us courage to act on behalf of your creation where it is stressed or broken and nurture our commitment to act as your stewards within creation. Give wisdom to the leaders who are meeting in Scotland this week at the Conference on Climate Change. May they be committed to make a change in the midst of, in the midst of challenging time. God of guidance, speak into our lives today. Wise God, hear us in this time of silence as we lay before you the people and places on our hearts this day. Now we join our voices with the followers of Jesus in every time and place in the words he taught us all. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Caroline. We will close now with uh, a hymn uh, called, Let Us Build a House. And I really think it fits with those words of Paul at the end of our reading today, where he's talking about uh, being built into a spiritual dwelling place where all are welcome. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Built of hopes and dreams and visions, rock of faith. Yeah,
outcast and the stranger bear the image of God's face. Let us bring an end to fear and danger. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where all our names, their songs and visions heard, and loved and treasured, taught and claimed as words within the word, built of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from floor to rafter, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. And now, may the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the friendship of the Holy Spirit bestow grace upon you and to all those you meet. And all God's people said together, Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping together this morning. God bless.